Legend says that brewing tea dates back to around 2737 BC, when tea leaves fell into water being boiled for Emperor of Shenong of China. There does not appear to be any hard evidence of tea being discovered this way, but evidence we do have suggests that brewing tea did indeed likely start in China. Indeed, it's first believed that it was part of a medical elixir. The first evidence of this is found during the Shang Dynasty, between 1600 BC to 1046 BC. By the Qing Dynasty in the 3rd century BC, it had become a relatively popular drink using just the tea, chamomile sinensis, rather than mixed with other things, as seems to have been common when used medicinally. From the beginning until the early 20th century, very little innovation came about in terms of the common method of brewing tea. This all changed in 1901. Contrary to popular belief and what every single tea manufacturer we could find states on their website and many a tea history book and paper consulted also stated it was not tea merchant Thomas Sullivan who invented the tea bag in 1908. While he did, probably independently, given his reported design was quite inferior to the original the inventor tea bag that year, he was beat out by about seven years by Roberta C. Lawson and Mary Malaren of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. On Today in History, August 26, 1901, the two intrepid women filed a patent, US 723287, for a rather unique at the time tea leaf holder that is remarkably similar to the modern tea bag. They had identified an issue with the way tea had commonly been brewed for thousands of years. In their own words, the traditional method of having to brew a whole pot at a time involves the use of a considerable quantity of tea leaves to prepare the desired supply of tea, and the tea, if not used directly, soon becomes stale or wanting in freshness and therefore unsatisfactory, and frequently a large portion of the tea thus prepared and not used directly has to be thrown away, thus involving much waste and corresponding expense. Thus, they invented an open-meshed woven cotton bag, folded over upon itself and stitched along its side edges, forming a pocket like construction having a flap at its open ends with the flap at the upper end folded down over the top end of the pocket and enclosed. A small portion of tea was then contained inside the enclosed cotton mesh bag and allowed the preparer to place it in a cup and have water poured thereon to produce only a cup of tea fresh for immediate use. By this means, only so much of tea leaves is used as is required for the single cup of tea, and thereby a cup of fresh, fragrant tea is prepared. About two years after the ladies filed their patent, it was granted on March 24, 1903. However, seemingly, they were unsuccessful at bringing this to market, at least on any widespread scale that would have registered in documented history. So this all brings us to Thomas Sullivan. Sullivan worked as a tea importer in New York when he supposedly accidentally invented tea bags in 1908. The story goes that Sullivan began sending small silk bags containing samples of various forms of tea he sold to customers as a way of encouraging sales. The accident part is that a number of those people who he sent the bags of tea to decided to use the bag as something of a tea infuser rather than opening the bags and brewing the tea in the normal fashion. As with Lawson and Malaren, aforementioned invention, this allowed a person to make a single cup of tea rather than an entire pot and made for a much more convenient cleanup as well. Once you were done, you simply had to throw the tea bag away. There was no need to clean out the tea leaves from the pot and the strainer or infuser. The little marketing campaign it worked, and orders started rolling in, which Sullivan initially filled via standard containers of loose leaf tea. Customers who received the loose leaf version complained, and Sullivan quickly began offering his tea once again in bags. However, silk bags weren't ideal for steeping standard loose leaf tea due to being a little too fine and expensive for a single serving. He thus replaced the silk of the original sample bags with gauze and then further tweaked things for better steeping by filling the tea bags with fannings, the broken tea stalks and tea dust that was left over from processing the tea. Sullivan then began heavily marketing his little invention and the tea bag it was well on its way to becoming a household staple. So how much of this story is actually true is difficult to discern. While it does appear there was a tea merchant named Thomas Sullivan who helped popularize selling tea in single-serving bags as well as in larger tea bags for brewing whole pots, there seems to be little in the way of documented evidence backing up the individual bits of this oft-repeated story. Whatever the case, we do know that commercial tea bags in the early days were not on the whole as good as Roberta Lawson and Mary Malaren's original design, other than perhaps the latter edition of a string to pull the bags out of the hot water when the steeping was complete. You see, early bags often used glue to seal the tea in rather than a folded or sewn bag. 
This glue then steeped along with the tea, gradually affecting the flavor. Various early fabrics used also frequently negatively affected the taste. However, despite many companies' early designs being less than ideal at producing the desired taste, convenience won out, and partially thanks to World War I, with certain countries' soldiers being given tea bags as part of their rations, the tea bag began to rise in popularity significantly by and then during the 1920s. However, while Americans relatively quickly embraced the tea bag, the British viewed the invention with skepticism and a bit of upturned noses. Shortages of the materials used to make tea bags during World War II also helped keep the tea bag unpopular in the UK, despite the convenience factor, and that by this time the tea bag was mostly perfected in terms of limiting its influence on the taste of the tea. However, when the 1950s hit, when products making common household tasks easier began becoming all the rage, the tea bag saw a huge surge in popularity and for the first time it started gaining traction in the uk by the late 1950s the tea bag had gone from virtually unavailable in the uk to controlling about three percent of the market beginning its slow and steady climb as of 2008, tea bags made up 96% of the tea market in the UK, a total surprisingly more than in the United States around that same time, where tea bags only held a 90% share versus loose leaf tea. Incidentally, tea drinking in Britain didn't become popular until around the 18th century, when tea smuggling became big business in that country. Previous to this, the taxes on teas made it unaffordable to the lower classes. And now for a bonus fact. If you've ever taken a glance at portraits from the 19th century, you're probably aware that huge moustaches were very popular with gentlemen of the era. In fact, from 1860 to 1916, the British military actually required all of its soldiers to sport a moustache for the authority that it imparted to the moustachioed man. Not surprisingly from this, gentlemen ultimately came up with a number of ways to make sure that their lip warmers were as gloriously trimmed and maintained as possible. One of the most popular ways to style a moustache during this time was to use wax. Some men also liked to dye their moustache to give it a more vibrant appearance. So what does any of this have to do with tea? The problem with both of these methods of moustache maintenance was that neither held up well to hot liquid. Dye would run and wax would invariably melt and cause unsightly moustache droopage the second it came into contact with something like hot tea or coffee. So enter the moustache cup, which is generally thought to have been invented by an English potter named Harvey Adams sometime between 1850 and 1860. The moustache cup allowed a magnificently moustachioed man to safely sip on a cup of steaming tea without getting it wet or contaminating his tea. So when Adams first introduced the moustache cup in Staffordshire, they proved to be a hit with the socialist lead, causing a wave of copycat products to hit the market. Although moustache cups are also known to have been very popular across the pond, finding a surviving specimen with a Made in America mark is incredibly rare. This is not actually a statement about their popularity in America, but because early American manufacturers would commonly falsely claim that the cups they produced had been made in England due to the high demands for English ceramics in the States at the time. Surviving left-handed moustache cups are also noted to be very hard to find, and even when the popularity of the cup was at its peak, left-handed individuals had to make do with a portable moustache guard that could be fitted onto either side of an ordinary cup. By the turn of the 20th century, the invention of the safety razor led to a change in grooming habits that made moustache cups obsolete for the vast majority of men. As a result, production and sales of moustache cups slowly dried up. By 1930, this formerly commonplace item was almost unheard of. It's also noteworthy that moustachioed men also found it quite difficult to eat soup without ruining their prized facial ornaments. So, of course, moustache spoons were also another invention that proved quite popular in the late 19th century. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Also, while you're down there and subscribing, hit that bell icon. If you do that, you'll actually find out when we put out a new video, which is great. Also, why not visit our sister channel today, I found out. You can find that linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.